buddy Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. A very busy day as always here on the program. Last night, of course, was Monday Night Raw, and it was the fallout for our fourth WWE show in six weeks, The Clash of Champions. And what a, what a fallout show it was. It ended, I am not making this up, with Randy Orton, who voluntarily left the building, dressing as a janitor to sneak back into a building he had not been kicked out of, sneaking into the room where the legends were playing cards, and by the way, not watching the Raw show, putting on a pair of welder goggles, which is what you put on when very, very bright lights are going to be shining to your eyes, putting on the welder goggles and turning the lights off, there was a sound of chairs clanking, but none of the legends were screaming, and then Randy turned the lights back on, put his disguise back on for God only knows what reason, and then snuck away afterwards. It was so beyond ridiculous that I will remember it for a long, long time. So I guess if that's the goal, then they succeeded. So we can talk about that here today, as well as everything else on the show. And in addition to that, we do have some some breaking news here today, which actually broke last night on the program. That is the departure of the president and CEO of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Harold May is gone. We'll tell you about that here today. Plus, an AW and NXT preview for tomorrow night. And Denise Salcedo debuts on the show today. She is the newest member of the F4W Empire. She's got a lot of fun things coming up today, and we're going to have her tell you all about it. It's going to be very exciting. Mike Semper Vivi joins us after the break, maybe for the last time for all I know. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Vivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. New Japan announced yesterday President and CEO Harold May will be departing the company next month. In their statement announcing the news, it was revealed that Takami Obari, who is the current CEO of New Japan of America, will become the new president and CEO of New Japan on October 23rd. At a meeting of New Japan Pro Wrestling's parent company, Bushi Road's board of directors, a change was announced in New Japan directorship. This is a statement from New Japan. The change will take effect at the beginning of New Japan's 50th year of trading on October 23rd. Outgoing President Harold May. New President as of October 23rd, Takami Obari. May wrote a blog on New Japan's Japanese website about his experiences with the company both prior to and during COVID-19. He apologized for announcing his resignation during the ongoing G1 Climax 30 event. He was appointed president May of 2018. Prior to his appointment, he served as senior vice president of Coca-Cola Japan and also had been COO of the toy company Tomy. So we'll see what happens. That's all I can say about a lot of things regarding this. We'll see what happens. Was the uh, one of the first questions you got from people? Because yes, it was definitely one that I got was yes, the forbidden door. Of we'll AEW. see <laughs> what happens. Yeah, it's uh, and it's interesting too. You know, he 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 sounds like you know, in his words, he's going to retire. That was the Google translation of his last message that he put up on the New Japan website, where he does a, a blog and. You know, it also sounds like he could have been voted out at a board of directors meeting. I'm not sure exactly how this thing went down, but the biggest thing is that the guy that's been in charge of New Japan America is the guy who's taking over, who is much younger and uh, very fluent in English. So, like Brian said, we're just going to have to see how this, all of this stuff plays out. It's going to be very, very interesting, especially when it comes to expansion and making friends here in the States. So tomorrow we've got AW and NXT. And tomorrow, by the way, Mike's Mike's running solo. But I think that he's got a, a big, exciting guest, so there will be a reason for you to tune in tomorrow. 
So he could tell you about that as the... What, the, what I need to have a guest to have a reason for people to I tune in tomorrow? I did not say that, Mike. I that's, am appalled at that implied, accusation. That's what you how implied, you dare bastard. You. How dare I? You started this show you. by threatening to fire me. I may not even be here tomorrow. It I could be did the not Salcedo threaten to showcase fire you. tomorrow. Yes. I did not we're, threaten to fire you. We're going from Semp to Salcedo on, on a Wednesday when you won't be here because you're going to be getting your teeth cleaned or whatever it is that you're going to be off gallivanting and doing. I'm you driving to Cannon to Beach tomorrow? tomorrow. I just got my teeth cleaned a couple of days ago. Oh, You no, didn't you even notice. That's right. He got his teeth I'm cleaned disgusted. a couple of days ago so he could look good on that drive to the beach where he's going to be away from I got from my teeth cleaned so that my teeth don't fall out when I get a little older. Like me. It's been a hard life for me, buddy. But you know what I'm going to do tomorrow just for the people? Because they have been asking for it and clamoring for it. We're going to have a little G1 talk tomorrow as well, too, as well as that guest and a preview of what's coming up on NXT and AEW tomorrow night. Well, I'm spoiling that for you. So the AEW show has Jon Moxley versus an opponent chosen by Eddie Kingston. This feud must continue. We got Darby Allin versus Ricky Starks. We have FTR versus SCU in a 20-minute challenge, uh, presumably for the AEW tag team titles. We've got Chris Jericho versus Isaiah Cassidy. Orange Cassidy, not related, faces 10, who somehow is not Anna J. I mean, that's like the easiest, it's the easiest joke in the world, but they gave her 99. Dr. Britt Baker will be in action, and Cody responds to Mr. Brody Lee's dog collar match challenge. I wonder what Cody will say about a challenge that involves him bleeding profusely all over <laughs> everywhere. Seems like they got to this a little quickly, but you know what? Uh, as a fan of Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine, I'm for it. We also have the NXT show, which has a mixed tag match, which means the rules are the women can do spots on the men, but not vice versa. Gargano and Candice LeRae will face Priest and Shirai. I wonder if they'll let the I wonder if they'll let Candice and Gargano do spots on each other since they're actually married. I guess we'll see. Kyle versus. Balor in a face-to-face, a verbal debate, and we have Shotzi Blackheart facing Dakota Kai. That's the lineup thus far for those two shows tomorrow. You know you know what we were going to have? And maybe we still will. The Finn Balor, Kyle O'Reilly uh, meeting, face-off, debate, discussion, whatever it is, moderated by Shawn Michaels, who was last seen laid out on the floor playing cards. No mask on, by the way with a bunch of other older gentlemen, most of whom have had money issues and had to borrow money from WWE at one point or another on the show last night. Was that a good way to transition to Raw, Brian? That was hideous. Absolutely hideous. But if you want to transition to Raw, I mean, we could talk about what happened, which was, yes, Big Show, Christian, Shawn Michaels, and Ric Flair were there, because here's the story, everybody. Randy Orton beat up the Big Show, Christian, Shawn Michaels, and Ric Flair. All four men returned at Clash of Champions in storyline without Drew McIntyre's knowledge. They cost Randy Orton the match, which led to Randy Orton beating up The Big Show, Christian, Shawn Michaels, and Ric Flair to set up another match. That's what we're talking about here. Also on the show, Zelina got a rematch for the title against Asuka after being submitted clean in the middle of the ring on Sunday, she was submitted clean in the middle of the ring again last night. Andrade and Zelina have broken up. Keith Lee is now solidly in the upper mid-card. He came out and he defeated Andrade. Truth traded the 24-7 title with Drew Gulak. Akira Tozawa has not been eaten by a shark. I'm not making any of this up, by the way. Jerry Lawler, Jerry Lawler interviewed Aaliyah Mysterio and the rest of the Mysterio family, which is leading to a storyline where the 19-year-old Aaliyah is romantically involved with Buddy Murphy here on this program. We had Mandy Rose debuting on Raw. Her new tag team partner is, in fact, Dana Brooke. They faced Lana and Natty. For some reason, Lana is doing all the work in these matches. I don't know why. She was dropped almost on her head. She was fine, 
but she was defeated. We had Alistair Black explaining that the reason that he doesn't like Kevin Owens is because when Seth Rollins and Murphy took out his eyeball, Kevin Owens was at home with his kids. Therefore, he is more angry at Kevin Owens than the two men that took out his eyeball. They had a match that ended when Alistair accidentally hit the referee. And so the referee disqualified him. This was followed, because this is World Championship Wrestling, immediately with a match where someone accidentally threw somebody into a referee, and it was not a disqualification. Dominic faced Murphy. The end of this match came when Aaliyah came out and did not want to see Dom hitting Murphy with a stick. Murphy rolls up Dom... Murphy is legitimately confused. He thinks a two is a three, so he stops covering Dominic at two, and the referee counts three anyway, because this is World Championship Wrestling. The Hurt Business faced Apollo and Ricochet again, but this time they have a new partner. It is Ali. He's getting another three-week chance. He got the win in this match, and I guess he's going to face Shelton next week. As far Where as I'm concerned, my guess guy is, is he would be defeated. Cop. He's still a cop. You see him messing around in the locker room. The guy's never been in a in a building before. It was messing around the hurt business's locker room. That was the only thing sense. that made sense on the show. He was at Raw and he said he was lost. I was like, I believe in somebody's that. Somebody's locker room. I believe that. Uh, and finally, Rude versus McIntyre. Bobby Rude. I can't even remember the last time Bobby Rude was on television. It was like pre-pandemic. He returns. They had a really good main event. Unfortunately, I don't think one human being on the face of this planet, including Bobby Roode's significant others, thought that he was going to win this match. But it was fun. And Drew McIntyre won, and then his friends were beat up again. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Can't confirm. Nothing ever goes right on this show. But Denise is all fired up and ready to go for the next segment. Denise Salcedo is going to be joining us to talk about all of the things she will be doing here. The mighty figure four empire. That's coming up next. But first, we have to do everybody's feedback. Because there is, of course, a lot of it. Spurs here says, you know what is the most ridiculous part of this upcoming draft? Apparently Mandy and Dana both can still get drafted back to SmackDown. Rendering the early trades completely obsolete. I hope what they do is they both showed up on Raw's team, and then the draft splits them up. That'd be a good one. This person notes, Bianca Belair doing a 100-meter dash and hurdle race with geeks. Her giving them a head start and still winning is the television I never knew I needed. Those vignettes are going to get her mega over unless Vince ruins it once she makes it to the ring. Well, he will ruin it once she makes it to the ring, but these vignettes are the greatest. And as I mentioned last night on the Observer radio show, When I was a kid, I watched Mr. Perfect doing all these vignettes to show how perfect he was. And he'd throw the basketball and they'd do the the tricks to show it go through the hoop or whatever. And he'd golf and all this other stuff. It was all a gimmick because he was Mr. Perfect. So we had to do some gimmicks to get him over as perfect. Watch Bianca Belair. And in fact, she actually is perfect. There are no camera tricks needed. She just smashes all these fools it's the greatest. It's the greatest. Spurs says, let me start by saying Dominic and Aaliyah are not bad actors, but the script made their conversation last night look like a bad high school play. 19 and 22-year-old, and they're already teaching these kids how to look into that camera and talk like no person does in real life. You mean how they all have to go out and line up in such a way that they're all facing the hard cam? That's a good one. This person says, why are they doing the annual draft on October 9 and 12 if they are just going to make random trades every other week anyway? Well, I mean, there's no long-term planning here. No long-term planning. I mean, we're going to do the draft right before the Survivor Series where everyone's just going to be on the same show again. So, hmm. Convince, convince Miss It with Bianca Belair. Yes, he yes. can. Yeah, I think we've proven that, yes. This person says, is Vince really putting a 19-year-old in a romantic relationship with a 32-year-old? But then again, he wanted an incest angle with his own daughter years ago. He is a weird old man. 
Well, what he wants to do, let me, let me, listen, I don't know, if, uh, hold on a second. It's, it's a little ridiculous. I don't know if Vince is a weird old man or not, okay? But what I can tell you is he is looking for ways to try to get people to watch his show. I mean, I don't think that he wanted to do an incest angle with his daughter because he was actually attracted to his daughter. I think he thought, man, if we do an incest angle with me and Steph, like, this is going to do gangbuster numbers. Springer stuff. Yes, exactly. So that's he's looking for things that he thinks are going to get people to watch the show. Sometimes more Steve Wilkos than Springer, but uh, yeah, and I don't know if there was any... I think it's more ridiculous that Rey Mysterio would continue to bring his family around and then at the very end there let his daughter out of his sights with all of this stuff going on for long enough to see her go out there and, and banter with his son, who has now got a job, supposedly. He's actually under a contract. Doesn't need the distractions against somebody he's going to beat up. Some guy who helped put his father's eye out and thought about putting his eye out. You know, it's just that's where it's ridiculous. But the reality is, is Rey Mysterio gets a pass with this type of telenovela stuff because the Eddie Guerrero thing works so well and because Ray does get sympathy and... Ray seemingly, and no pun intended, gets eyeballs from people who don't necessarily watch Raw every week on TV. This is one of those ones that, if done correctly, even if we think it's ridiculous, will pull in spouses and girlfriends and other people that will be interested in this storyline. Is it great from a pro wrestling point of view? No. But will it be good for the show and ratings? Probably, and the one thing that it has going for it is because of who is involved, we may not like how it goes, but they probably have at least a little bit of a better handle on this thing coming to a more satisfying ending than a lot of their stories do that just don't go anywhere. This person says, Randy Orton being the janitor and taking out all of the legends was hokey as hell, but I cannot lie, I laughed my ass off. I did too, but it was because it was so hokey. I can't figure out... Listen, would it have been that hard for Randy Orton to be kicked out of the building so at least we have a reason why he wore a disguise? He just left on his own and then snuck in. Why did he have to wear a disguise? <laughs> right? I don't. Because nobody ever catches retribution, so you might as well just do that because you know you'll never get caught. I mean, I, like know, putting... I know this is nitpicking, but like... I just watched SmackDown, where the main event storyline was that Roman Reigns gave his cousin a dirty look, and his cousin watched it on TV. So, you're telling me that Randy Orton had to sneak into the building to do a mystery attack, and, like, no one's going to watch the television to see who did it? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. My question will be, will there be any sort of revenge by Randy Orton on MVP for throwing that water bottle at him? Remember that? I do remember that, but I don't know if that was the same janitor. Mm. Was that to set it up? That was their subtle way of setting up storytelling for later on, a little foreshadowing that we're going to be seeing a shadowy janitor in the background that happens to be Randy Orton? I don't know. This person says, did they get rid of Raw Underground because they finally realized it wasn't doing anything for the ratings, or was it due to ongoing safety measures? Well, here's the deal. I'll ask, but my guess is like nobody knows the answer. It'll be whatever Vince decides next week. But yes, there was no Raw Underground. There was no mention of Raw no Underground. No mention. That's it. How it just vanished. Was that? Gone. Poor Shane. <laughs> I mean, it could be that there was just like nobody available for it. I mean, well, that's the deal with the performance center when it comes to to people in the crowd, right? So I mean, that's it's look, it's it's what it is, and it's I don't know, I don't know. Go ahead. This person says the last time. Bobby Roode had a match on WWE TV. It was against our tribal chief in January on SmackDown. Wow. Well. Demi was great, though. Him and McIntyre, that was such a good match. That's what pains me about this show. Like, there's so much bad stuff, but dude, they have, they have, they have the ability to do so much great stuff. But there's a bottleneck. So it's like your whole deal with Drew McIntyre for the last God knows how many years. All this dumb stuff, but the, the talent is there. There's there's something there. There's greatness there. But then they, they give you what they give you. 
This person here says, Did you pay attention when MVP threw his water bottle at that janitor to bully him backstage? That hey, was okay. Randy Orton mopping the floor, they said. I think they just, I think it was just like an Easter egg. I doubt it's going to lead to anything, but you never Randy know. Randy Orton was really pushing a mop. He was really dedicated to getting into character before he went back and kind of sort of very, very quietly beat up those old men with those goggles on. It didn't seem like night vision goggles, which amazes me. They weren't. Me. They were welder's goggles. That's, that's what kills me about Florida with all the rednecks, and I'm sure they got a hunter on that roster there somewhere. I'm sure Drake Wirtz has got something like this, you know, a, a gator in the back of the in the back of the truck and some night vision goggles out there hunting deer or whatever they do down there. They in were Florida. night vision. It was like Randy's plan was, I'm going to turn the lights off. I ain't going to be able to see, but I'm going to make sure I really can't see by putting on these welder goggles. My dad builds fences, okay? I know people think I've never done anything, but I am well aware of welder's helmets and welder's glasses and all of that. And he, this dude with those goggles on in a dark room, that guy ain't going to be able to see anything. Unless he he brought in the sun with him, which he did not do. I was still watching. Impro- still haven't proved you did anything. You just proved that you know what a welder's helmet and goggles look like. I did plenty, Mike. Oh, yeah? What do you think I, I dare- developed this physique? Not planting feds, posts. This person here says, Mike is wrong. The Randy versus Drew storyline is not over. Of course it's not over. They're going to hell in a cell. He flat out said in his interview that he was going to bring hell to Drew McIntyre. Is this leftover from yesterday or it something? It might be. September 28th. Oh, it is mm-hmm. yesterday. Look at that. Well, Mike, you're wrong. Just so you know. That guy knew yesterday. Raw needs a complete redo. The same matches every week. The same feuds for months. I don't even think a draft can save it. You know a feud's been going on for too long when we've seen the feud forever and it leads to one of the performers coming out and saying, (laughs) this feud has been going on forever and literally nothing ever changes. Which is what MVP said last night. And he wasn't wrong. Although they brought back Ali for his his one-week run. This person says, it was funny, when the referee DQ'd Alistair Black, Joe started saying how the referee brought that on himself since he was standing too close to the guys. Because that's what happened. They're doing a match. Alistair Black accidentally hits the referee. The referee calls for a bell. And the heel Alistair Black is rightfully outraged. Why are you calling for the bell? The ref was too close. It was the referee's fault. You know how many incompetent referees we've had in the last four weeks here on this program? Alistair Black's going to lead Retribution, isn't he? You think they got any plan? Oh, God. They debuted Retribution and didn't know who was going to be in it. He's got new music. He's got a a new eyeball or uh, contact up in there. Uh, The new little entrance, little deal that he does. I don't know. Now, if we're going to have him feuding with Drake Wirtz, the referee, and feuding with the system, because let's remember, at the end of all this, this dude got laid out (laughs) and got put out with a stunner. So if this is what it's going to be, uh, maybe that's the direction you want to go. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Observer Live, uh, Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. I've waited all this time to officially... Officially welcome our guest today, Denise Salcedo, to the program here today. Newest member of the Empire. Denise, how you doing? I am so happy to be here. What's up, Brian? What's up, Mike? You know, I've been listening to you guys all the time in my car drive, so I can't believe I'm finally here. I made it. I'm on Wrestling Observer Live, so this is awesome. You know who you remind me of, and I'll bet you anything no one's ever told you this before. Who? George the Animal Steel. <laughs> Why is that? Because one day we were doing the show and the producer came into my ear and they said, do you know some guy named George the Animal Steel? I was like, yeah, he was a wrestler. And he said, he's on the line right now. And we picked up the phone. And in fact, George the Animal Steel said every Sunday he drove around in his car and he also listened to Wrestling Observer Live. So look at the tie in with you two right here. Oh my God, that is such an awesome story. I'm like, I'm thrilled to have been a part of that. Well, I've got a giant list of things that you're, I mean, you're going to be doing a lot of things, not just with this website, but there's a bunch of things you're going to be doing for us. I could read them here, or I can allow you to introduce all of the things you're going to be doing for us. So this begins tomorrow, by the way. 
I know. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I mean, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo is officially a thing. It's happening Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's going to be awesome. So I'm excited because this is a technically my first show that I'm hosting and producing all on my own. And I'm very excited because I've been looking for an opportunity like this for the longest time. And to finally just to come out and talk about something that I love so much, pro wrestling, and do it in my own way. I am so happy that I even got this opportunity. And I'm excited because I want to essentially do a show that's fun and that's interactive and that people will just come on and have a good time and you just chat about things that we want to chat about when it comes to wrestling so that's one of the things i'm doing and then i'm also going to be on twitch recapping the aew pay-per-view shows on your guys's twitch stream so i'm super excited about that as well as creating some additional content so i i'm very happy to just sort of you know branch out and just trying to keep be creative and just you know make more friends in wrestling so for those of you that are subscribers and are wondering because i've had a lot of questions about this so the Wednesday and the, well, let's start with the Wednesday shows. The Wednesday shows will be up in audio format as a normal podcast afterwards. So if you normally podcast all of the shows, this show, Observer Radio, Mike's show, whenever he actually does them, you will be able to podcast Denise's show as well. And also the post pay-per-view shows will be available for podcasts. Normally Vinny and I do post WWE shows. Denise is going to be doing post AEW, so... That's going to be your role there. And for the Wednesday show, I mean, it's it's 8 Pacific, 11 Eastern, so it's right after AEW and NXT, which, of course, are head-to-head -head live. How are you going to manage both of these shows, watching them live and then doing your show immediately afterwards? All right, so first of all, I'm the queen of multitasking. I'm always working on like a million things at once, but I've been watching the shows side by side. I've done, you know, certain days where I'm watching side by side. I've done shows where, oh, I'll watch NXT first or I'll watch AEW first and then I'll watch the next show after that. So it's going to be a challenge, but I'm definitely ready for it because um, I just think it's going to be really cool to just kind of come out here and talk about, you know, the best things that we're seeing on AEW and NXT and just really talk about everything that's going down on both shows and I also want to incorporate different uh, other topics so you will be hearing my thoughts on AEW and NXT but you will also be getting a little bit more and I'm going to be trying out different stuff with the show each and every single week I want to incorporate lots of different segments that are just you know fun and silly and just overall just get people talking about wrestling because at the end of the day we have two wrestling shows going head to head which is just great for like the business in general and great you know for people like us because we get to talk about it now i'm a i'm a very old man so as you can see i've got all these this boring acoustic paneling behind me but you've got quite the studio set up here you and filthy even semper vivi he's old but somehow he's got all this stuff in the background what can you tell us about what you've got in your studio there all right, so first of all, I did this just for you guys because prior to this, I just had like a boring blue wall, which you can see back here. Oh. But I just started to like, you know, take everything out and redecorate everything. So what you're going to see on this side here is just a bunch of, you know, action figures. You'll see uh, Kane, Brock Lesnar, The Undertaker, Love Machine. Uh, you'll see Goldberg. And then I also have Mask here. Uh, I love how Love Machine was in the middle of all of those. He yeah, died right in 1994. In also the mask, and then we have uh, some DVDs right over here. A uh, Psycho Clown mask up there, which my grandma is absolutely terrified of. In the back, you can't really tell, but I was Triple H King of Kings for Halloween, so I have the mask that was custom, that we made uh, right there in the back, and then just, you know, some more masks over here, as you can see. But all the way in the back, I do have like a collage of like awesome moments that I've had throughout my career, you know, interviewing people like Becky Lynch or Stephanie McMahon, or working on Sean Walton show Xpoc 12360 or appearing on the watch along so I kind of just did like a little collage of photos of you know memories that I'm proud of and just kind of brought it all in to just I know it's super distracting but I figured it'd be a lot more fun than a boring blue wall so you were triple H for Halloween Yes, I was King of Kings Triple H. You know, the, I had the gold mask, which you can see back there. I had the, you know, the I got like a football, like the football, uh, 
the, the, the little things that you put on here. Sorry, I'm not a football expert, but I got one of those and I put some cones on it, some foam cones to get the spikes and painted it gold. Then I had the red robe and it was pretty cool. Uh, so it was just kind of like a fun thing, but I like to go all out for Halloween and do like fun costumes and whatnot. I've done like Alexa Bliss, Finn Balor. So just little random ones here and there. So that's just one of the memories. Do well, let's come, tell. Oh, go ahead. On, do you come from a family of wrestling fans, or is this just something that you, you know, when you were very young, said, "I love, I love this stuff, and this is what I'm going to be all about"? Or were there other people around you that they got you into it? So the way I actually got into wrestling was my uncle was a big fan, you know, teenage boy, really into the Attitude Era, all of that stuff. Well, my uncle got his first job, and this is in the day of DVR, v, I mean, sorry, VHS. You don't have DVR. So once he got his first job, he could no longer stay home and watch Monday Night Raw. So he needed somebody to record the shows for him. So I was just like a little loser kid at home with nothing else to do. So he was like, hey, Denise, like, can you record wrestling for me? And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. So he taught me how to put in, you know, the VHS into the VCR, how to press record and all of that stuff. And so I kind of just stuck around and started watching the shows while I was recording them. And I would press pause in between the commercials, resume when the show started. Sometimes I forgot. So some parts were missed. But Oh, my was, God. This guy had you cut out the commercials while I he was it. at it? A pro. Well, and not in the beginning. I kind of, um, I elevated. I just became better and better, I guess. But I'm, after that, that's that's sort of how I became a fan. And then one day he was like, hey, I'm going to go to this this wrestling event. And I was like, hey, can I go? He was, ask your mom. My mom said yes. My first wrestling event was UPW in Anaheim, which was absolutely awesome. And then from then on, God. he would take me to every WWE event that came out. He would take me to PWG, you know, back when the tickets were like $25, $50, so we could afford them. And, um, <laughs> you know, just random lucha shows here and there. So he was the, really the one that embedded wrestling into my life and then before you knew it it was just something that was a part of part of who I am 19 20 years later and I'm still watching because I started watching when probably early 2000 late 1999 was when I started okay so a lot of people when they talk about their their early memories of wrestling or what got them into wrestling I mean occasionally I hear like my buddy Vinny he saw the when when Randy Savage came off with a ring bell to the to the larynx of of Ricky Steamboat, but like a lot of people, their their first memory of wrestling, what what they liked was just like you look back and you're baffled, like you got into like whoever Dino Bravo or something totally crazy. What when you're doing these tapes, what caught your eye? What got you into pro wrestling? So first, when the first one, the, my vivid memory was obviously Austin, and it was the middle finger thing. That's what really did it because you know it was so crazy just to you know be out there you know doing the middle finger. And so my uncle was teaching me how to do it, and so I would go around the house basically being Austin, flipping people off, that sort of thing. But the one that really like sold me, and this was where like oh my god, I'm a fan, I'm this, and it was Chris Jericho, and I just thought that everything he did, everything, it was like. That that was my person. That was my wrestler that really got me invested. And then after Jericho, it became Triple H. I've always been a big Triple H fan. Kurt Angle always to this day has been one of my all-time favorites. So it's pretty interesting how like the people that I decided on would be my favorite wrestlers right from the start are the ones that, you know, stayed on still even till now. They're still the people that, you know, I ship, that I stand. And so it was always them who got me interested in it. And the cool thing about my uncle too is that he would you know try to get me to you know he would show me his tapes that he would watch that so he would try to teach me stuff from the past that I didn't know about so that was something that it's kind of weird how it all sort of tied into now and never in a million years did I think I'd be doing this as a as a career never so you have been described as this is like virtually every single person who who has told someone else on our board who doesn't know who you are she's bubbly and she watches everything so, obviously, we've got the bubbly part out here. So, the watch is everything. What does that mean? All right. So, I think that sometimes people just expect you to watch maybe one thing or, you know, one company or whatever. You know, there's different types if of If only fans. we were so lucky. 
<laughs> yeah, but the thing is that I try and I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not claiming to be an expert or anything like that, but I really do try to watch a little bit of everything, whether it's Lucha, whether it's New Japan, uh, you know, obviously in AEW, WWE, Impact Wrestling. And throughout the years, it's something that I've tried to do because one of my favorite things as a wrestling fan is actually following the careers of guys. That to me is one of the most interesting facets of wrestling. So I love things like discovering a guy at PWG or something and then you know seeing him wrestle throughout the indies and oh all of a sudden he got signed here I love things like that and I love Will to Hobbs know that yeah, exactly. So I love to know when things, uh, when somebody, you know, gets hired, someone I could say like, oh, I saw this person here and I saw this person there. And I just think that being a, watching a little bit of everything really, uh, you know what, it sort of sets that standard of what you expect from a good wrestling match a lot higher though, because I've noticed that I've become bougier in my taste of wrestling matches where as maybe in the way... Uh, an original match that I saw like a while back, I'd be like, oh, this is the greatest match ever. But now that I've been exposing myself to more wrestling, now my standards have changed, which I think is cool oh. because it just shows you what's out there. So do you ever go back and watch some of that stuff that you grew up on? I do sometimes, you know, but I mainly like to watch like compilation videos on the network. So I go back and watch like, you know, like the, oh, the top 100 raw moments, oh, the top this type of moments. And I like to go back and think, okay, what do I actually remember? Because I have a terrible memory. And then it's really cool when I see things where I'm like, you know what? I remember that. Or, oh, this is how I felt when I saw this. And I was a very gullible wrestling fan. Like I'm the ideal WWE fan in the sense that I believed everything I saw on there. So just sort of going back and laughing at all the things I thought were truly real and seeing now just how gullible I was. It's just, it's so funny. Like one of my favorite ones is when uh, when Kane set Jim Ross on fire. And I swear, I was so pissed that day. I was like, how did the camera man not save Jim Ross? He just kept recording it. And it was so silly because during that time, it was something that I thought was real. And so going back, I just like laugh at those like dumb moments of things I thought were real. I love that even something that you thought was real, you still understood it didn't make any sense. Yes, I was so mad. I remember thinking, well, that's just horrible. If I was a camera person, I would stop recording and I would save this person. And it was just dumb, dumb things like that that I thought about and crossed my mind every so often. Well, we got like 10 seconds, 15 seconds here. What, when did you get smartened up? When did you realize these people weren't getting burned? Um, Honestly, probably maybe like... It was really late. I was like 15, 16 when I started oh, realizing man. things. Really, really late. Let's just leave it at that. All right. Stand by, everybody. Back in a moment. Observer Live. Is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Denise Salcedo joining us here today. In two minutes, she's going to try to tell you everything that she's doing all over the world. Good luck, Denise. Floor is yours. All right, here we go. First of all, catch me on F4W Online's YouTube channel every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time for Speak Now Pro Wrestling with myself, which I just talked about it. I'm going to be talking about AEW, NXT, and so many other wrestling topics. It's going to be a very fun and interactive show. And then after each and every single AEW pay-per-view, you can come on here on Twitch, and we're going to be talking all about whatever goes down on AEW. So so make sure to come in for that, and that's going to be during the pay-per-view. So after the pay-per-views, the post-shows. Also, you can check me out on YouTube. On YouTube, I do a hybrid of pop culture and pro wrestling content, which I just am about to put out an interview with Candice LeRae, and that's YouTube.com slash Denise Salcedo. Twitter and Instagram at underscore Denise Salcedo. Plus, that's not all. On Mondays, you can catch me on the post-Raw review show with Sean Ross Sapp on Fightful. That's on their YouTube channel. And then on Thursdays, sorry, excuse me, Friday mornings, I have a show on Wrestle Talk with Luke, and you can check that out as well. We talk about wrestling topics as well. And then Friday, I'm on Sports Kita's Facebook page talking and recapping SmackDown. So a lot to a lot to keep up with, but I post about everything on Twitter and Instagram at underscore Denise Salcedo. I think you just knocked Mike off of his chair. Excellent job. <laughs> right when the music gets you was done, everybody. Did you see that? Tomorrow night on our YouTube channel. She'll be doing a special post show every single week. Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo on our YouTube page every Wednesday night. We'll tell you more about that tomorrow. Denise, thanks so much for doing the show and all of the future shows. Mike, as always, callers and listeners, we'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.